Appreciate it. All right, welcome back. We are game 2005. Uh, that's game physics in the fall 2020 semester at George Brown. And it's week 14. Wow, really near the end. Uh, really have one more week left. Let's go to where we're sitting. We're sitting here at week 14. And the topic today was supposed to be particle systems, but I've kind of put a line through it. Um, and I'm putting a line through it because <laughs> although I would talk about some interesting stuff with uh, with uh, particle systems, I think it's more important that we talk about unity. <laughs> more unity and a couple of additional things, because I think you guys need more of that um, from what I'm hearing. Uh, a couple things, uh, administrative things. Assignment 4 is now moved to Monday, December the 14th at midnight. I've given you a few more days just to make sure you can get this done uh, properly. I don't want you to uh, to go too too crazy. I know this is going to kind of uh, overlap with your uh, final test that I'm going to release next week but I think it might be better for you guys just to get a couple more days to get your assignment functional um, you know for the end. So normally this assignment would be due tomorrow uh, but again I'm going to give you the days over the weekend uh, plus Monday all day so that way it'll be a good chance for you guys to um, to submit and have more time. So hopefully that that uh, gives you more time, and uh, I'm not sure how are you guys are feeling about that. Is that okay? Okay. Anna says Tuesday. <laughs> Anna, I don't know if I can do Tuesday. Uh. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I thought that there might be just other things that clash on that day. And that's why I wanted to give you an extra day or so to do it. For me to push it to further on in the week is going to kind of completely overlap with what I'm going to do with you next week. And uh, I'm not sure that's going to help you to go beyond Tuesday. So that's why I'm saying Monday might be better uh, for some of you. Uh, or most of you, I think, uh, especially since you get other courses that are kind of, uh, for the most part, um, happening at the same time. So that's what's happening then. Um, so again, for your final test for me, it's going to start in the week, the, early in the week, Monday. It's going to end at the end of the week, Friday. You'll have the whole week to get it done. Uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, meter it for about two hours uh, to complete. It's going to be using Unity right uh, so that way it's uh, it should be easier for you to set set up um, there might be some things that I ask you to do that we covered today or last week or, or whatever but most of it is going to be uh, you know kind of simple concepts uh, that I want you to pull off so nothing that's going to be outside of what we've talked about and if I if it's outside of what I've talked about I'm going to make it accessible to you guys uh, through unity systems and components all right, so uh, if I ask you to do something different. Uh, one thing to note is that next Thursday, there will be no lecture during our, um, our lecture hour. I'm going to be using it as office hours to meet with anybody. So there will be no physical lecture. I will still open up the, um, the Zoom call just to be able to kind of take questions and give feedback and help out with anything that's left over for your uh, final test um, or any other kind of feedback that you want uh, for this semester. So that is what I'm using Thursday for, just to make sure that you guys are clear on that. All right, so, um, and what we want to do today is I want to continue with more Unity. Hopefully I can patch up some of the stuff you've missed uh, with Spencer and with other things. That's why I kind of planned it. I saw that Spencer kind of had a hiccup on um, on Tuesday and I wanted to make sure that you guys had a little bit more time with me on Unity so that way it can help you with your project. So on that, um, what I've done is Anna's asking how final tests will be. We need to submit two hours from start. No, 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 no. My estimate is it should take you two hours to complete. That's how long I think it'll take you approximately. Right? That's with the video and everything. Okay, That's like the whole thing. Two hours, right? But you have the whole weekend. Up. So if you start off on Monday, let's say as an example, you have until Friday at midnight to get it done. Uh, okay, so you're saying it's a little brutal, brutal on Unity. I know, but it's supposed to be on 3D, the last part, right? So it's either that or SDL, uh, Mary. So it's up to you. 
what you want me to do. I, I personally think Unity is going to be easier. And even if you need to do something and look it up, you've got lots of resources and, and document uh, documentation, tutorials, all that kind of stuff you can hook into because it's a fully open book exam. Uh, I'm, again, I'm not going to focus on anything else that we haven't talked about. So hopefully it should be fine. And I'm probably going to give you a starter just like I'm doing today, right? So that way you have something to start with and you don't start from nothing, all right? So that's somewhere where I'm going with it. Again, I don't think it's going to be that crazy. Um, it, I'm hoping that it's just going to help with some of the stuff that you're doing. Is it just shooting bullets in FP? Is that for today? Are you talking about Tam or what are you asking? The exam? Oh, no, no. Yeah, we'll do something else. Don't worry. Okay, so let's take a look here. Um, I've, I've shared with you on Blackboard, there is a starter package. So let's go to that. So on Blackboard, if you look at the uh, lecture content, there under week 14, there is a starter pack that's in here for Unity. So please download this if you haven't had a chance to already. Uh, this is where I'm gonna be starting and it's kind of a continuation of what we did last week. And I wanna talk about a few additions we made last minute uh, last week and talk about the technology then and re kind of revisit this again. All right, so let's talk about this. So I'm just gonna bring up uh, Unity. And I'm going to go to the lesson 14 starter. Today's projects has an issue. Did you download it and and and, uh, and, um, and decompress it? What did you do? What was the problem that you expect, uh, Sheila? Because it shouldn't have a problem. You shouldn't have an issue at all with it. Are you saying like double click on the on the on the play scene? some asset load problem that's interesting shouldn't have an asset loading problem but um, it should be okay does anyone else have this issue because this is where I start off with this is the project that we, we start off with or we left off with last week Well, the way you get the plane is if you double click on, if you go to scenes and if you double click on main, then you'll get the plane. So go there. And yes, you can double click on the main scene. That's a good strategy as well. So if you double click on the main scene, so the way you would do that, I'm just gonna bring down my uh, tool here for a second and bring up uh, the, let's suppose I'm using the same thing. So I'm gonna go to my desktop, GBC, Going to go to uh, 2005 and go into the lesson. If I go into assets and if I go to scenes and then if I double click on the main.unity uh, file, like so, it should bring up your scene. Okay, and if it gives you this message that says your project was last saved with a different version of the editor and blah blah blah, does not match this editor, that's because I have multiple editors. All right. But you shouldn't have this issue. If you get this issue, um, you can certainly press continue, but it's going to mess you up if you go lower. I've got uh, several editors installed, versions of the editor installed in my machine. So an example is if um, I've got, from an installation perspective, I've got 2020 and 2019. I'm using 2019 for VR. Uh, there's some compatibility issues with some things I do in VR in 2020. So that's why I need to use 2019. But uh, if you're starting the project, you only, ha you only have one installation and it's 2010.110F1, you shouldn't have a problem. If it's some other version than this, then that's where you might have a bit of, of translation to go, okay? I'm just gonna bring up our project that we, we had before, so I'm gonna bring that up. Again, I'm waiting for you guys to join me and I'm hoping you guys are gonna uh, be up with me. Okay. All right, so yeah, we have our little plane here. You should be able to see this as well. And we also have, um, we also have our, um, a couple things that we have a couple cubes that we have here. And you see this, this uh, kind of like this, um, this color that goes around. We talked about it last week. So I'm gonna go to scripts here and go to my uh, cube behavior. We have a couple of scripts. Remember that the way Unity works with scripts is uh, that each of the scripts is connected, 
right again to a game object right so if I was to bring up if I was to bring up cube behavior notice that I've used system.serializable here system.serializable is a C sharp script a C sharp attribute uh, if you will or a decorator and what that does it makes my my script available throughout my project typically I also anything that I made public like last time if I do any public um, uh, variable here then I will share it by default in the editor so example if I if I call something public and this is different than what you would have seen in C++ because in C sharp we don't have a uh, areas in your class it's all one there's no dot h file or dot cpp it's just one dot cs file okay so this is the kind of stuff that we talked about last time so it's kind of like uh, in a bit and this is where maybe Mary was a little bit concerned it's a bit of a C sharp uh, kind of crash course at the same time that you're learning unity but the great thing about this is that you've got a ton of resources out there that you can go to uh, when you're when you're googling or when you're when you're looking at for tutorials right so but I want to try and bridge the gap for some of that today so again just to review so review anytime I put public then it, it reveals it in the editor so if I go back to my editor and if I look at anything that cube behavior is attached to remember that when I have a cube like for example I have my player cube and the player cube when I click on it in the hierarchy it highlights in the editor right that's how it works and then notice that I have my cube behavior script connected as a component, right? Then if anything that I've shared in my um, uh, in my script, right? Going back to that script, like for example, public vector size, that gets short, sh you know, kind of shared here as X, Y, and Z, okay? And the same thing goes with maximum and minimum. If it's colliding, if it's a Boolean, it becomes a checkbox. These are, I'm just going through it again just to make sure. Also, what I've created is a list of contacts, and I kind of did that at the end of, of uh, last week. I know some people had to go, but I can I kind of kept going a little bit longer than than regular. And what I had was I created a mesh filter component. So the mesh filter component is something that can appear um, in the scene if I want to. I'm just gonna add Megan here. And what I'm doing with a mesh filter component is I'm connecting to the cube, right? So the cube, um, you know, as an example, I've made a group of contacts. So it's a, a private mesh filter. And anything I make private, obviously, is not going to be exposed here in the editor, right? So pr by default. So private variables, not exposed. Public variables, for the most part, are exposed as long as they're primitive types or types that Unity understands. For example, if you make your own class, it may not appear here. All the details may not appear in the editor um, if the uh, you have a custom object that you're kind of putting off. But if the custom object is made up of primitives, then you might have a chance to see everything here anyway. And the great thing about seeing stuff in the editor is you can modify things on the fly, okay? So that you can do that. So that's what these public things mean. Uh, Unity has two lifecycle uh, methods that we use start and update start triggers once uh, as soon as the game object comes into play inside the hierarchy start is triggered and that means that anything in start only fires once you can think about start as in many ways when it's a mono behavior type class replacing the constructor so there is no constructor in unity if you notice in mono behavior we don't use the constructor we use lifecycle functions and one of them is start so this is the first uh, in the execution order start fires first then the update method is the update loop and it triggers every frame now there's a couple of things I have to mention there are a couple of different updates one of them is update there's also something called fixed update and there's a third one called late update okay so there's uh, all those three different kinds um, typically update will try and run as fast as it can Okay, that's the first thing. Fixed update will be on a fixed time step, uh, and it is going to be something that's deterministic. So it's going to be running on a deterministic time step. So if I used, instead of update, if I used void fixed update, by the way, you can do both. You can have both in place. So for example, sometimes what I want to do is any physics related, uh, you know, calculations 
a lot of times I think that fixed update will do you better in terms of because it's a fixed time step whereas update runs as fast as possible so if I want to render something update if I want to do something with physics movement that kind of stuff especially when I have jumping or whatever fixed update and if I want to do something after those two let's say I want to clean up something late update okay those are the those are the different kinds of uh, updates you have and so there's a uh, um, other things that the other reasons why we want to use these um, we also introduced something called on draw gizmos which is another lifecycle function that's built into to unity except it's not as used and we use on draw gizmos this function to trigger any debugging that we want to draw custom gizmos and we did that we draw we drew a wire cube um, in unity so if you notice here in unity I have a wire cube that goes around the object right so if I turn this off here again if I just go here to draw wire cube and just comment it out and save then all the the colors around the cubes will go away when when everything uh, recompiles by the way every time I change a script inside of uh, unity and I come back to the editor it will recompile immediately a real-time recompile so just letting you know that okay so I created the cube the uh, the wireframe just this way we can visualize the bounding area, the bounding boxes. Okay, so that's what I did with uh, with this. And we just use magenta as a value. You can use any kind of color that you want. Um, and I told you before, you can use any kind of shape you want. So for example, let's suppose that I want to use, from a debugging perspective, to help you a wire sphere. I can do that. I can say gizmos.drawwiresphere. It's all here. So you can do that. And then you can decide on it gives you some code hinting so it says let's go to the center so the center will be transform dot position right and then and this is going to look weird you're going to see and then the radius um, and the radius should really be the if you think about it the scale right so um, that's what we really want to look at whatever the scale is um, and what we want to try and look at is the transform local scale for now. So if I said transform dot local scale, right, that would be the radius, but you have to think about it in what direction. You can choose either X or Y because it doesn't take a vector, it takes a number, a floating point number, right? So for example, you can take what, whatever it is. If it's an odd number, then this is where the sphere doesn't make any sense. Let's just use X for now. It doesn't matter which one we use, but you'll see what this does, okay? So if I was gonna draw some kind of wire sphere, you're gonna see now when I come back, I've got spheres around everything, right? I get a sphere around here and a sphere around here. And like I talked about before, spheres in many ways are um, much easier from a collision detection and impulse detection uh, perspective than uh, cubes because you don't need to necessarily care about the bounding area. Uh, it's equidistant from the center. Whereas a cube has, uh, you have to use a different way of, of connecting um, and calculating a collision. All right, so that is spheres. So let me go back to this. So again, we, can, we may want to use this later on. I'm just going to turn this off for now because we don't need to use this right now. And again, as soon as I come back, it recompiles and I'm back to this again. Are you with me? Check mark if you're with me at this point. You have the project come up. You know what you, you can see it. It's working for you. Those kind of things. But like I said earlier, you can always use anything I give you as a base. It's pretty sparse right now because we haven't done much with it. But anything that I share with you is fair game if you want to include it in your project. Okay. All right. Thank you for that feedback. Some of you are following along, it looks like, and some of you are not giving me feedback. That's okay. I'm going to move on now, just for the sake of time, so we can move on. Thank you. So what I want right now, if I if I run my game, and if you see what I've done, I've, I've included a uh, first-person perspective, an FPS kind of um, uh, you know character controller in here. And one thing that the character controller has that I've included for you guys is uh, you know kind of a camera so if I use my mouse I can look up and down right and left all this kind of stuff I've provided this for you so you can use it but we need some kind of firing mechanism for my object as I move through the scene right so if I move around the scene 
And if you don't like, by the way, the head bob and all that kind of stuff, you can turn all those things off. Let's do that. Um, I think it's a little bit annoying sometimes when we're, when we're doing a simulation. So, because we're not playing a game necessarily, I can go to my FPS controller and rename this to player. And I mean that, uh, let me just go back out here. This is the player cube that I have, a green cube. Uh, let's just call this, you know, um, an obstacle instead of the player. So the green cube, this one, let's call it obstacle before I rename my FPS. So this is my FPS controller, so let's rename FPS controller as player. Um, the obstacle, um, as an example, is green, and that's fine. My player doesn't really have a body. So if I actually look at my player, you can see by default that what I've been given is a couple of things. One is a, if you can see here, I've got a, a capsule collider that Unity has provided for us. Again, I, I'm not going to expect you to make your own character controller for the game. If you do, great, it's awesome for you. I'm not going to allow. I'm not going to uh, force you to do it because I don't want you to feel overwhelmed with all the the level of uh, of detail that you have to go through to get this done. Um, there's a lot that's been in, involved here uh, for you to do it. Okay, so again, for now, let's just leave it out. But when I click on my character controller, my player, I have a lot of additional information here. Right? One is there's a built-in character controller component that we're using. Uh, I just want to mention this. There's also a first person controller script that basically calculates things like walk speed, run speed, jump speed, stride length, and a bunch of additional uh, details. The mouse look, uh, how it works, um, if I want to invert it or not, all kinds of crazy stuff that it includes here. Um, FOV kick um, is interesting. What I don't want to use is head bob. I can just turn that off. So no more head bob, right? Um, there's also a jump bob, if I want to have that. Bob means moving your head up and down, right? Uh, footstep sounds. Uh, you can see that there's several footstep sounds in included. Um, you know, you can silence those if you want by taking this away. I don't care so much about the footstep sounds. I'm okay with it. There's also a jump sound and a land sound. So these are some sounds that have been included with the game. You have a rigid body that is built into the uh, first person controller as well, where you have a mass and you can see that gravity is being used. So I'm, I'm using the rigid body that's built into the first person controller here. And this is the only place that you're allowed to use um, Unity's physics just to make it easier for you. Not because you couldn't do it. It just makes it more difficult if you don't, if you don't do this. Um, so that's that part. We have an audio source, which is where the, the sounds come from. And that really is your first person character controller. Okay, so that's kind of a, at a high level. You also have a nested camera. So inside of the first person character controller, you have this camera and if I click onto it, it shows you what you're looking at in the scene. So it's detached from this camera. This is the camera that we had before. Let's just delete the old one. So I'm gonna right click on the old camera and delete it. You don't need it anymore. But my first person controller has a camera that follows along with it because it is a child of the player game object. Let's rename this first person uh, character um, camera as player cam. That's your player camera. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Now remember what I want to do is I want to have a target that I can look at and there's some techniques we can use in Unity to produce a target. Um, if I want to show a label or anything like that here in Unity I can add a label to my scene. So let's talk about that a little bit because we really haven't talked about user interface items before. Now if you've done this before, please bear with me as I go through the details and I, so I can help everybody else here. That's what this, this is really for. So I want to add a label, right? For example, things like my frame rate. I can do a lot of stuff. In my standard assets, there's actually a pile of additional utilities and things you can tap into um, you know, to give you some additional things. For example, I've got a rigid body first person controller if I want to use something different. I'm not using that. I'm just using a regular first person controller. That's what I've dragged and dropped from my standard assets uh, you know, that I've downloaded from the asset store into the scene. So that's why I'm able to do the player at all right now. Um, also, there are some additional things here. You can see that there are different kinds of effects you can use, different shaders, and so on. Editor changes. 
again, I'm not going to go too much into this. I just wanted to go through it. And there's a utility area with prefabs. One is a frame rate counter. Let's bring that into the scene. So I drag and drop my frame rate counter, but I need a canvas for this to lot to sit on. So let's right click in the scene here. So I'm going to go to UI and I want to go to canvas, right? Here's my canvas. And what a canvas is, is screen space, is a screen space um, area where I can, I can uh, kind of place uh, UI items like labels and buttons and those kind of things. Notice that the canvas doesn't appear here in front of my character, but rather if I double click onto it, it's actually uh, abstracted way out here. So let me just bring, let me just zoom in here. So this is the canvas and if I click 2D, you can see the canvas kind of looks like a screen, but you don't see the player. It's like I draw the canvas out here in, in screen space. And this is a representation of where the canvas is going to be and what it's going to look like. But it's actually going to appear for the character in their eye, right, in eye space. Okay, so that's where it's going to look at. It's not in camera space yet. It's just a, it's a screen space overlay is what we're looking at. And if you actually look at look at the canvas component here that I put in, you can see that there's a canvas component with the render mode as screen space overlay. Okay, you can choose different modes. For example, world space. If you want something to hang out in world space, like some kind of uh, um, blackboard or something or a whiteboard that you can that everyone can see diegetically or you can make it lap onto the camera if you wanted to as well either way is okay for us I'm gonna keep it on overlay for now I'm gonna talk about the camera way of doing things later all right in my overlay my canvas then I can drag and drop my frame rate counter right from my <clears throat> from my standard assets free prefabs I'm taking my frame rate counter and just drag it in on top of the canvas as a child object, okay? And if I double click on it, it appears like way down in here, like really low, right? And um, you may not be able to see it, right, as an example. So let's move it around. Let's grab this item and move it. And one thing is with the frame rate counter, um, one thing to note is if I was to run this thing right now, right? So here's the frame rate counter and here's the text, right? Um, my text doesn't even appear. If you can't see it here, then you won't be able to see it there, right? As an example, you just won't be able to see it at all, right? So here's the style. If I run the code now, right, as an example, you can see that I don't really see the frame rate counter anywhere, right? It doesn't appear. Why? It's really too small. Like I'd have to zoom right in uh, for me to see this as well. Um, one of the things that is an issue with this this part, uh, this frame rate counter itself, uh, is not just the size, but the layering of, of this thing altogether. So it says FPS, and you should be able to see it, but you can't. If I make it really big, let's say I make it much bigger. Um, and by the way, one thing also to note is the frame rate counter's position on the z-axis is zero. It's on the screen space overlay, and it says Shader channels, normal and tangent, are most often used with lighting. Um, you know, do you want to turn this thing on, this frame rate counter, uh, or whatever? So I can't see it here, is what I'm saying, right? It doesn't matter what I do. And if I make it even bigger, like a bigger text, I highlight FPS and I say something like, I want to make it 50, you know, it's still unviewable, right? I'm just letting you know this because, you know, you can try and, uh, and put the frame rate counter on your screen, but you won't be able to see it. So what if I move the camera, the canvas, as an example, instead of screen space overlay, I change it to camera overlay. Well, instead of you did screen space camera, what you need to do is drag and drop the camera in here, the render cam, and the render cam is the player cam. So if I look at the player cam here, right here, I'd have to drag and drop from the player cam into my canvas, like so. Now everything is one, and if I go back to the uh, canvas, right, you can see that there's a couple things that have happened here, all right? My canvas and my player camera are in the same my, the same uh, space, if you will. You still can't see anything, but we're going to come back to this in a sec. One thing is the order and layer. Cameras have a really weird uh, thing when it comes to order and layer. Sometimes making it an order and layer uh, higher is good, right? So here's my canvas, right? And a good test for the canvas is if just to put in a piece of text. Like let's say for example, I add to the canvas 
the UI. Let's make it a um, regular text for now. You can see that the text appears in my canvas. There it is, right in the middle. And let's make, just this is a test, okay? I want to show you this. And let's make my text, um, you know, something that I can see. So let's make it white. So again, I'm, I just, all I did was I, I went to the canvas, I right clicked onto it, and I added UI text, regular text, not Text Mesh Pro. And now that I have the text that says new text, let's change this to a plus. Okay, just a big plus. And let's make it so that the text uh, appears white. So again, if you scroll down, you can see that the color is right here. It's black by default. If you click into this color field right here, you can change it so that the text is white. There it is. You can also change it so that when I click on the text, let's call this the reticle. Reticle, or let's say the, you know, where we're, we're aiming, right? So this is the reticle, right? And I want to make it so that it is centered. I'm, I have a problem because my text also has, is right here, and it's behind other gizmos. I can turn gizmos off by doing this, right? Or I can go into 3D icons and turn them really low, right? For now, though, we can see that there's a plus that's in the middle of my screen. Okay, it's kind of in the middle of my screen. And if I actually go to the game, right, and what we want to do is be able to see the plus. Okay, if you can't see the plus, that is a problem, right? So notice that I, I, I can see the plus, but it goes behind the other objects. Notice that? Why is that? Because of my screen space overlay, guys. That's what it is. If I put it in screen space, um, as an example, it has an order and layer, and it, it does really weird stuff, right? Whereas if I had my reticle and if I go back to my canvas and I went from screen space camera to screen space overlay back to that right um, and if I was to look at it again by running it you can see now that my reticle should appear on top of everything a little plus okay it's not really a reticle it's just a plus right but what I want to do is make this bigger. So I can highlight the reticle and go down to font size. And let's make it something like 40. And let's see what it looks like now. So much bigger. Right? In fact, it's so big that in my, my uh, canvas, it can't hold the item. Right? So if I double click on my reticle now, if I, or, my, or my canvas, let's go there. Let's go to my reticle. You can see what's happened is it's so big that my reticle is outside of my canvas area. So right now it's 40, but the height of my object is only 30. If we made this 50, you can actually see the reticle that's in my camera. And this harkens back to what we're seeing here in the frame rate counter. The frame rate counter, the height and the width is zero, right? Look at that, height and width is zero. The height and width here is 30. Well, that's really weird, height and width is zero. Let's make it 30 and 30 and let's see now do we see my frame rate counter at all because without a height and width well then we're not going to see this thing at all right frame rate counter you know we should see it right and we don't and if you want to you can try uh you know kind of uh, larger values notice that my scale on my frame rate counter is also zero which is kind of weird right and when I add it 111, we start seeing something there. There's something that comes up. There's a kind of a boundary box, all right, that comes up. We can actually see this, right? Here it is. It's 160 by 30, the frame rate counter. Let's make it match that. For some reason, it's coming in really low. Let's go to 160 by 30 and see what my frame, can frame rate counter looks like. Still can't see the text though, right? So that, I'm just showing you what ways to fix this problem. Font size is 50. So even though it's 30, it should be much larger. Let's make it something like 60, right? Uh, from the, the height of this object. And let's make my frame rate counter 60 as well. All right, so now we've got lots of space for this thing to, to appear if it was ever going to. Okay, I'm just pointing out some stuff that people will have trouble with when they try this out the first time. Okay. Other things that you notice is the canvas scaler, right? That is non-root canvases will not be scaled, right? So this is what this is, right? Um, and if I was to drag this, I made it in the canvas. So I put the canvas in here, 
perhaps this itself is a canvas item because it has a canvas element here, right? Well, if that's the case, let's get rid of the, the, this whole thing as, as well. We can always start again. I can show you what this says. So we got the reticle. And when, the, when I click on the reticle now, we should see a pretty big reticle come up. Let's take a look at that. So it almost looks like a, an aiming area, right? I can go right through the cubes because there's no collider with me and the cubes, right? I can do that right now at this point. But you can see that the reticle comes up in the middle. The reticle is just a touch for, so that it helps our character aim. And when we, when we create our gun, we can kind of point it to the area that we're going to uh, launch our, our bullets at, okay? Again, it's up to you. You don't need it for your assignment at all, but I'm, I'm recommending it. All right, so if that's true, if the FPS counter, right, as an example, I'm just going to un uncheck this. If my FPS frame rate counter, it has a couple of things here, right? It has a, it's a canvas, right, with uh, its own graphic ray caster, right? So, and the reticle itself is here, right? Sorry, the, the, um, the, the frame rate counter is, is here. And if I drag and drop this frame rate counter, let's get rid of the canvas for a second. So let's go here and just delete it. We'll put the reticle back in a second. Remember that the reticle we made was a, and we can have more than one canvas too. If I drag and drop this in here, right? And I open it up, I can take the reticle and just drag it into the frame rate counter, right? As an example. And if I delete the canvas or hide it, so I only have one canvas at a time now, and if I look at this thing, you can see that clearly I have a canvas still, like we did before. And the text for the frame rate counter is way up here. And now we can see it. Well, let's make it white. So now we're, we're gonna make this text that's up here, we're gonna make it white. So we're gonna go to down in here, we're gonna click on this thing, color, and choose white. And I'm also gonna make it so that it is uh, bigger than what it is right now. Right now the maximum size is, it goes from 10, maximum size 40, and it's using best fit. Okay, that's just a tactic. So actually it should be appearing pretty big in our scene. Let's take a look. There it is. And you can see that I'm running at uh, 900 frames per second, right? The scene is rendering at 900 frames per second for me, right? Uh, you might think that's crazy, but actually, um, my frame is my frame rate isn't being limited in any way, like I told you, right? And it's trying trying to render the scene as fast as possible. So this also speaks to my hardware, like my kind of hardware compared to your hardware. If you're seeing much lower numbers here, or if a lot if you have a lot of fluctuations, it speaks to the number of draw calls you're making compared to the number of draw calls I'm making. All right, so. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So I'm not sure if you're getting that if you try it out, but all I did again to get that number is I just dragged and dropped the frame rate counter. I got rid of my own canvas. So I got rid of this and I got dragged and dropped the frame rate counter in here and I've got a text object. That's the frame rate counter and I pulled my reticle, which my reticle is just a text field with a plus. That's all I've done. And I've kind of centered it on the screen. By the way, if you look at the rec transform, you can you can use the rec transform to move your text anywhere you want on the screen. So if I use the alt key, if I press the alt key when I'm pressing the uh, rec transform of anything that's in the canvas, this is the frame rate counter canvas, that's what it is. It actually allow me to move my object anywhere in the screen automatically. It'll snap to that position, right? If I press alt. So if I wanna make it go exactly in the center, I can do that, right? If I wanna make my frame rate counter as an example, this text, right? So let's just call this text counter. You can rename everything, of course. It's all up to you, right? So let's say my, I want to move my counter to the top left corner of my screen. I can just literally go to my rec transform, press alt, and then click this left button, and then boom, it's just going to go to the left corner of my screen. So it'll snap to that position, okay? And that's probably where I want it. I don't want it in the center of my screen. I want it kind of somewhere off to the side where it doesn't bother me, okay? So hopefully you guys are with me. All I've done is I've, in, I've put a little reticle in place, a little plus, and I've got a frame rate counter that talks to my performance. I can always shut that down. I can always go to the top where it says counter and not draw it, right? I can just hide that part if I don't want to see it, okay? All right, so that is the canvas, and you can see that the canvas is in a space uh, that is not on the camera space. The camera space, if I go to my player cam, right? And I'm just gonna go out of 2D for a second. 
that is right in here. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to put in place a cannon, some kind of cannon or object or some kind of like, you know, uh, gun. I'm not going to use a real cannon, obviously. I'm just going to make it a cylinder that kind of goes inside here that kind of projects and that I can use that's inside of my camera object, right? It's actually going to sit inside of my player cam. That's where it's going to go. So Unity has a bunch of, of uh, primitives that we can use. And if I right click, I can add a 3D object cylinder anywhere I want. Let's add a 3D object cylinder to the player cam. So I'm going to right click on the player cam, go 3D object cylinder. Now when I do that, it's massive, like massive. And it's so big that it takes up my entire view, view screen. Like if you notice, I have a cylinder now and I have a shadow, right? Which is really weird. And I don't want that. So, and that's not really what I wanted to do anyway. So the cylinder should be a color. Let's make the cylinder um, something that makes sense, like a gunmetal gray or something. Um, so I want to go back to materials. Here's my materials folder. And let's add in a new material. Actually, what I can do is if you notice I have a material here already, I'm just going to uh, copy paste or control D. If I press control D on anything in Unity, it just duplicates it. So control D duplicates it makes it from red, I can call this gunmetal, let's say as an example, and I can change the al albedo and the, my shader type. Let's make the albedo into something that um, is more reasonable, so something that is grayer, something that looks like this, maybe a little bit darker. We can also make a material shinier in Unity, right? By uh, when I click on the material, I can go to metallic and increase the how metallic it looks, how shiny it's going to be. So I can increase that. But I rather look at when I do metallic uh, and all that kind of stuff, I'd rather go with instead of a regular standard shader, uh, there is another one that I like to use called specular setup. I want to go to the specular setup for Unity. Um, and my smoothness is something that you can change to make it super shiny. So I want to go with the specular setup with a shinier kind of surface like this. So that's what I want for my surface of, uh, of this thing that I'm going to make. Okay. Again, from a smoothness perspective, all I've done is I've gone to standard specular setup in my shader setup, in my material, my gunmetal material, and I've moved from standard, from standard setup to standard with specular. Once I've done that, I've chosen a color from an albedo, if you want to uh, copy me, of 130 down the line, 130, 130, 130, and 255, so fully opaque, right? So if you want to see what I see. And then from a smoothness perspective, I think something like a 0.6 might be pretty good from a kind of a shine perspective. Okay. Now I need to apply this gunmetal material to the cylinder, right? So if I can click on the cylinder and let's just call this my gun or my cannon, we'll call this the cannon, right? So here's my cannon. And in my cannon, I want to drag and drop my gunmetal material where it says materials. So just drag and drop that gunmetal. All right. One thing to notice is it says cast shadows is on, receive shadows is on. We got to really think about this for a second. I may want to receive shadows and cast shadows, but that's going to add load to my, uh, you know, the way it works. Let's leave these on for now. I don't want a capsule collider. I don't want my my uh, cylinder to have any kind of collider, like I said, right? Cannon? Sorry, I'll change that. Thank you. I was kind of thinking it should be cannon. Cannon! Thanks, Dan. Uh, sorry, it's what happens when you're live, right? Cannon, the company sells cameras. Yes, thank you. Uh, so let's get rid of this capsule collider. We don't need it. So just like right click and remove component. I don't want a capsule collider. I'm not supposed to use them anyway, right? As per my instructions, except for the this thing that I'm doing. All right, but the cannon looks like it's like really, really big like this, and I don't like it. Uh, let's scale it down, and we'll do it by eye for now. So I'm gonna go back on the tool menu. Notice we have this scale tool, and all I wanna do is wanna grab the scale tool and kind of go in so that it is small but long. And I'm gonna keep doing that until I get the shape that I want from my cannon. So I get smaller and then longer and then smaller and then longer until it becomes something that I like. Okay. Now remember this is inside the player can. 
all right, that I'm doing. So I've got my player and then the player cam and the cannon. All right, now I need to rotate it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my rotation tool and I'm gonna rotate the cannon so that it appears that it's gonna be rotated around uh, 90 degrees. So you can actually click in there and put 90. From a scale perspective, this is kind of weird, the numbers, right? So let's make some numbers that make sense. So I'm looking at the cannon that's inside my player cam. The scale, the rotation is 90. My position I'm gonna change in a sec. But my scale should be something like, let's say 0.1 for my scale on the, on the x-axis. It looks like 0.4 for the y-axis and 0.1 for the z-axis, right? That's what it looks like. Now, if I look at this in my game, I don't see it. I don't see it because, and this is where I want to try and split screen for a second. So I'm going to drag my game uh, screen. There's my game screen and my, my scene. I'm going to grab this game scene and put it down here so I can see both at the same time. Because I want to be able to capture my player cam. There's my player cam. And you can see that I don't see it. But what if I take my cannon and then using my move tool, I want to move it around. Oh, look, there it is. Look at that. And I want to move it down right and to the right a little bit and maybe what I want to do I want to move it forward so I can start seeing it in my scene right there's that that's how long it is it's probably a little bit too long right from my perspective but something like that okay it's got a point to the middle of my scene this is the most important piece so all I've done is I moved it around so what are the numbers so I've got my Canon is again 0.485 I've got negative 0.172 and 2.48 let's make these numbers something that's more reasonable again negative 1.72 let's make it so it's negative 0.2 maybe that's wrong maybe it needs to be higher up we'll see and uh, on the z-axis uh, 0.2 let's make it 0.25 right so we may have to change that up again or make the uh, we may we want to resize this thing in a sec and from an exposition is 0.48. Let's make it like so it's like 0.5, right? So it's kind of like some even numbers or better numbers. All right, so where it really looks like is it's coming out of the side of my face, which is like way over here. So we need to move this just a little bit more. And you can use these numbers to move things around too, all right? So example would be, I wanna move it left on the X axis. So let's move it more left, right? So kind of something like this and looks like 0.35 might be better for me, right? And maybe a little bit up on the, because uh, it's Y up on the Y axis. So we're gonna go with uh, minus 0.1, no, minus 0.15, maybe a little bit lower. It's almost like between 0.15 and 0.17. But the way to see this is if I run the game, right? Then it should be, we should try and point to my reticle so let's see if we can do that in real time so i'm going to go kind of uh to the uh the gun and we'll fix this this clipping in a second um we're going to go to the gun and what i want to do is i want to make it so that it it looks that it's looking at the reticle and that means we have to change a couple things so if i move the uh, y-axis right it kind of is something that looks like I don't think the y-axis is the problem, so that, that looks pretty good. So my negative 0.15 looks about right. Maybe the z-axis is something that I gotta, I gotta bring it in a little bit. Let me see. And maybe on the x-axis we'll move it across just a touch. Something looks like that. Again, you want to make it seem as if you're making a, a kind of a straight line from here to the reticle, so it looks like reasonable. You may have to move this again. All right, so again, 0.35, it looks like we were right, negative 0.15, uh, and then 0.35 is how much we want to put this out there. So 0 0.35, 0 0.35, negative 0.15. You can remember these, or you can right, you can click, left click here, copy component. So left, so go on the ellipses. When I got here, I'm in play mode, copy component, and then when I stop playing, if it snaps to something else, I can go to that canon and then go to that component and then paste component values. All right, there we go, so it's a little longer. One thing I don't like is this clipping. And the reason why this clipping is happening is because of my near plane. 
So remember what the, new, the camera is, right? If I look at the camera object in 3D space, right, you can see that I've got a couple things here. I have got this near plane, and the near plane starts here, right? And so I've got this thing clipping right here. This is what's happening right now, right? And so I'm seeing part of, of this thing come into play, this, this uh, view, right? But let's bring this closer. What happens if I take this, this uh, object, look at what happens too here. I take this object and I move it closer into my, into my view space. So let's say something like 0.1, right? So that's the first thing I want to do. Move that to 0.1. Okay, again, it's not going to be like this. It's obviously going to look like this when we're playing, right? So now there's no more clipping. Also, the far plane is pretty long, right? Maybe like 100 might be better, all right? Because you, the longer it is, the more it's going to... Uh, you don't need to look far too far away, as an example. And now we can probably bring this back. Now, when I play this thing, we can see more closely what it looks like, if it looks right. So here's my cannon. And if I run over, you can see that I have this thing floating in space. Hello! Right? That doesn't make any look... Remember, I told you that this may not be reasonable. And we may want to try and remove it. Right? So... Um, do you want to center on the screen? Sure, you can do whatever you like. Um, I'm just putting it on the side here because that's, that's what I like. Uh, but so what I want to do here is we want to take away the cannons uh, re uh, casting shadows. I want to receive shadows because that looks pretty cool. It looks more realistic, but I want to remove shadows from being cast. So no casting shadows. So then when I run, you're not going to see a cannon casting any shadows on the ground. All right, so that's the kind of thing I don't want. So I don't see... Wait... I don't want to see the cannon <laughs> casting shadows on the ground, I said. I can receive shadows, but no casting shadows. All right? Make sense? So if I see, let's save the scene and let's run. And I shouldn't see anything on the ground. No ground, no casting. But there's a problem, right? Look at this. If I take my camera and go through, it'll clip my gun through the object, which doesn't look right right and what I want to do is well I don't want to see this the gun do this at all right this is actually wrong 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 right I want the gun always to be outside of my object appearance wise so let's think about how to do this well one thing we know is this cameras in general have something called a culling mask right so here's the culling mask and notice right now we can see everything the cannon can be on its own layer. So let's put it, let's make a new layer for the cannon, all right? So it's just an object that's being drawn in 3D space, right? So if I go to the cannon's layer, so cannon, go to the layer, and if I go to add new layer, I can put in the cannon layer. Okay, so cannon is a thing now. I have to attach the layer, I have to actually select that layer now that I've created it to go like this. So cannon, this thing is part of the cannon layer. Now what we can do is if I don't want to see this in the camera, I can go to the player camera and I can go to the um, culling mask and I can turn it off. I can actually uncheck this and now you see that I don't see the cannon anymore. Cannon disappeared. But in the scene, it's actually physically there. This, the cannon is like part of my player. It's inside of my eye pretty much, right? That's where it is. Okay, that's the cannon. So, what the heck? Why did I do that? Well, remember what we can do. I can make another camera. I can have as many cameras in the scene as I want. Okay? Let's put another, another camera in the scene. Okay? And I want to talk about this. Right now, by the way, the camera that I put in the scene sees the skybox. In the, in the clear flags, we see a skybox in the background. Okay, let's add another camera. So I'm going to right click on the player camera and I'm going to add another camera. And this other camera that I'm putting in there, I'm going to call this the gun camera. Gun cam. The gun cam, right, is going to see the, notice it, it can see the cannon, right? That's in a, a preview down here of what it can see. The gun cam can see the cannon. I don't want to see a skybox though. I want to see solid color. And I want to see the solid color be black. Let's make it completely black, like so. 
And here's also what I want to do. Never mind that it's black, right? A solid color. I want to go to depth only. If I did depth only and I move the camera around, right, as an example, you're going to see nothing right now, right? Okay. One thing at a time. My gun camera has a depth level, right? My depth is zero, right? And my player camera also has a depth of zero. Let's make my gun camera a depth of one. So I'm going to change my depth to one. So higher number than the player camera. Now when I run it, you can see that I see my gun camera again. I see my gun again one more time. Right? Why? My gun can see, my gun camera, which is this thing, can see my cannon and sees everything else. But I only care about using depth only, depth legs. Let's turn off everything else but the gun camera, but the gun. So if I take my cannon, right, as an example, let's put the cannon inside my gun camera. So la la. Right, and if I look at my gun camera, it's just a just a layering that I'm doing here. Player cam first, gun camera inside the player cam, cannon inside the player the gun cam, and then the cannon, what I want to do, or in the gun cam, I want to turn off, I want to go to my culling mask, and I want to turn off everything except for the cannon. So nothing. And then I want to add the cannon. That's the only thing that it sees. So I don't see anything except for the cannon. My player camera sees only this stuff. My gun camera sees only the cannon. Notice that? It's black except for the cannon. And then what's happening is I'm getting a layering effect. My gun camera is layering on top of my player camera. And I'm creating a consolidated effect at the end that looks like this. So now when I go over here, my gun camera doesn't seem to go, my gun doesn't seem to go on the object at all. It's an illusion because it's being drawn on top of the objects, not on the same world space. One thing we need to do, because I added another camera, is I need to get rid of the audio listeners that's in this. So I've got a warning. So the, get, the player camera has an audio listener, and I can get rid of my audio listener that's in the gun cam. Let's get rid of that. So remo remove that one. And now I won't have this warning anymore when I start. Right? And this is good. This is, gives me the ability to always be to the for the gun camera to always be there. It's not going to be occluded by any object that I that I kind of pass into because I can't pass into the object. Are you with me? If you're not, this is a great place to put it up on GitHub, right? And then you can have what I have. So again, techniques. All I'm talking about is techniques, and this is good for your 3D uh, OpenGL stuff that you're doing as well. Because at the same time, what we're doing here in Unity, you can do in OpenGL as well, right? You can take a camera, and then in, and what you're going to do is that camera is going to see certain things, and it's not going to see other things, right? We're going to use um, a technique, a culling technique, to say, hey, this camera can only see certain things at a specific depth, right? And then what we can do is we can layer another camera on top of that to create an effect. Okay, that's what we're doing with this gun camera. So the cannon is really just a prop. That's what this thing is. But it's sitting inside, if you notice in the gun camera itself, it's just sitting here and it's by itself. Right? Why? Because I don't need to I don't need to draw it again. If I drew the the scene again, so not depth only, but something else. Let's say for example I put in a solid color and I want to choose a red color, let's say, right? Well, guess what? Because the gun the gun camera is sitting on top of the player camera then what we're gonna see is a red background and that's it right but unless I wanted to make the red background some kind of uh, I, I wanted to add transparency you know as an example to the background so make it somehow uh, you know opaque or transparent but it doesn't matter even if it's zero it doesn't matter at all it's still not gonna show because of the way it's layering so that's why we can't use a solid color and we need to use depth only and then when I run the camera again, you can see now I'm, I'm back to where it is. All right, cool. So that is the technique that we have there. I'm going to put this up on GitHub now because then it'll give you a everything you need for what we have so far from our uh, from our project. This is the starter that we talked about before, right? At this point, 
and I built it up with you so you can see what I did. Okay, let's file, save, file, save project, and then I'm going to close this off. And I'm going to go into uh, my command prompt this time. And I'm going to pull in the project and put it up on GitHub. I've already got a Git repository connected to this, right? So let's bring it up. So again, it's on desktop, it's on GPC, it's on uh, 2005, and it's this project. So I'm just going to say CD space and drag and drop in here. And I'm going to say git add dot git commit minus M, and we'll say added gun and gun cam. Git push, and you should have now everything. This whole project should be up online. It's just in case I was going too fast, you missed it or whatever. Download it from here, and away you go. You don't have to worry about continuing the project if you couldn't follow along. You've got everything starting off from where I'm at. All right, let's kick that off again. So I'm going to go back to my Unity Hub. And I'm going to go back to my my uh, uh, number 14. And I've got my the start, a start of my little FPS. By the way, if you had other kind of assets, like a real gun or whatever, you could replace the in the in the player in the gun cam inside the cannon. Just replace the cannon with a real object, a real gun looking at it. And now you have a real looking cannon as opposed to this thing. But we don't care about that. It's just primitives we want to do anyway. And now what I want to do is I need a firing point. All right. So I want to be able to instantiate an object that's right in front of the gun camera, right? Right in front of this um, cylinder, right? And this is where my new object is going to be created. Okay. Now, we can be talking about things like object pooling again and so on, because I talked about object pooling before, and I'm going to do that. But for now, first things first, let's make a new object that goes right there. So what I'm going to do for now is I'm going to make a new sphere object that is basically right in front of the gun camera. To make this happen, I'm going to go into a different mode. So I'm going to look at it from the side. So notice I can look at the view from wherever angle I want, right? And now I'm looking at it from the side. I can zoom in here so you can see that this is the front. And I can go from uh, this little orientation here, which looks like some little rays that cast out this way. And it says left. I'm going to click on this little area here, and it's going to become orthographic. All right? So now I'm in an orthographic projection, all right, just on this little thing right here. So I can choose the area that I want to kind of place my object, right? So in here, in the scene, what I want is I want to add a new sphere. So I can't do it here, right? But I can do it here in my, in my, uh, in my option. I'm going to go to player. I'm going to go to my cannon. And right on the cannon object itself, I'm going to right click and add a 3D object sphere. It's going to be massive. It's pretty big, right? And what I also want to do is I want to remove the sphere collider. Remember, no sphere colliders allowed. Let's get rid of that. Remove component. And I want to drag this object, right, kind of forward so it's in front. It looks weird because guess why? We're in orthographic mode. And what I want to do is I want to pull this sphere out from the gun and out of the player so it's just way out here. Why did I do this? Because now the orientation is where I want it. It's a trick again. If I come back out of here, if I come back out by clicking this little area right here where it looks like three lines, if I click this little area again, I'm back to normal again. And you can see that I've got this long lozenge shape. Why? Because of the scale that I've chosen. It's trying to match the shape and scale of my gun, right? That's what it's done, almost like a little bullet. I don't care so much for the shape. I do care for the orientation, however of the sphere because it's oriented at zero. Let's make it so if I made it zero, it would point up. And then if I change the, the scale so it's all point one, now we have a bullet. And the bullet, my friends, is oriented exactly in front of the, uh, the gun. Here's my bullet. Well, this is not what I'm going to use. I'm going to use a bullet like this. But I want to drag this closer. So notice that what it's going to do, if we did it right, is right in front of the the uh, the gun itself. I want to put it just in front, like right here. This is going to be where I'm going to represent. Uh, so I mean, I need. I'm going to. This is the sphere 
uh, that I'm going to use for the bullet of this, the idea behind it. The size is going to be 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0.1. But what I really want to capture is the position of this thing as the place where the where the bullet is going to spawn. So I'm going to call this the bullet spawn. So rename the sphere, right? Call it bullet spawn. There's my bullet spawn. Okay. Now obviously I don't want it to hang out here, right? I want this bullet spawn to be right with the gun. In front, it's in front. It's going to be part of the cannon. So I'm going to take the bullet spawn and put it back in front of the cannon now. So bullet spawn is actually relative to the cannon of where it is. So it's it's a 0 0.111 scale, 0.25 on the z-axis, which is weird. All right, see what it looks like. All axes looks good to me, right? So, but this is taking into account the scaling of its parent, the cannon. I don't care about the scale anyway. All I care about is the position. In fact, we can get rid of all the other things that are in here and just leave the transform. So let's get rid of the mesh. Let's get rid of the mesh renderer. Let's get rid of everything. And all we have left now is a little position. If you want to visualize this position, right, that's okay. We can use a gizmo for that. If you look at the right corner or the left corner here of your component, I want to grab this and make it so that I can visualize it. I'm just going to choose bullet spawn so you can see it. So this, what this does, it actually puts a little label that's visible and it's actually, notice that it is billboarded to my uh, editor camera. So it's always going to look at me no matter where I am. So that is the bullet spawn. That is the position that the bullet is going to be now be instantiated. That's what I want. You won't be able to see this object because it's not renderable. Here's something else. Um, I want to be able to, these debugging guides are neat. I like them, but I want them to be turned off one, uh, somehow from the inspector. So I can go in here and turn it on and off if I want to say debugging is on. So let's go back to, we have a couple things, right? We have our script for my uh, obstacles, right? Or my enemy or whatever. Let's go into the script in here. So my cube behavior script, double click. And notice that I have, I'm just going to undo this one. Notice that I have these two things come on. I want to turn on a another public um, Boolean. I want to call it um, debug, right? I want to kind of turn debug on and off, right? So I can do that by going in here. I'm just going to put it here, public, bool, debug, right? By, by default, I'm going to make debug here equal to false. Okay, so debug is false. That's what I'm saying in the start method. And then I'm going to say this. The only time that I want to show this is if debug is true. So I'm going to say that if debug, then I want to show, oops, I want to show, let's try that again. I want to show this stuff only when debug is true. I'm going to cut this and put it in here. And now it's obviously not going to show it, but what it does is it gives me latitude in the editor to turn it off and on. Okay, and that's per object, right? Not for everything. So if I do this and save, and if I go out to this, notice it's going to turn it off. But if I wanted to turn it on for, let's say, the cubes for some reason, right, then I can click on the particular cube that I want the enemy and where it says debug, I can turn it on, right? So I can see that visualization now anytime I want, okay? So I got this cannon that's hanging out here and it's floating around, okay? And there's a bullet spawn in front of the cannon, right? This bullet spawn is just a non-drawable game object that I've put in here, but it's updatable. It's gonna move with the player. So when I move my bullet spawn, it's going to move around with me. It's because it's parented or it's a child of the cannon, wherever the cannon moves, so too does the bullet spawn. So that's good. Okay, now what I want to do for now is I want to instantiate bullets, right? Whenever I press my left mouse button, when I press my left mouse button, it's going to make a bullet appear, all right? It's not going to fire the bullet or trigger it in any way. I'm just going to make it appear, all right? 
So this is going to happen somewhere in the player controller. So I've got my player right here. I've got my first person controller, right? What I want to do is I want to just collapse these areas here, right? And I want to go into my add component in the player object, add component, and I want to make a new script here. First, I'd like to make the script, then I want to drag and drop it into here, okay? That's how I do it. You can also click new script, but it's going to put it in some odd location. That's why I like to make the script first and drag it in. That's how I do it. Other uh, Unity teachers will do it differently for you. So here I'm going to right click and I want to do create C sharp script and I want to call this player behavior. Here's my player behavior script. It's empty right now. I want to go to my player after I've created the script and drag and drop it on top of this add component like so. Okay, and now I have my player behavior script connected to my player game object. Let's double click on my player behavior script and when I double click it's going to bring up player behavior in Visual Studio. Fantastic. Now what I want to do with it is I want to do a couple things, right? First of all, I need to know where the bullet spawn is. So I can find it. It's possible. I can find it, right? Or I can just drag and drop. Let's do the dragging and dropping thing. I need to know the transform of the bullet spawn. So I'm going to go here and inside here I'm going to say public and I'm going to say transform. That's what I want. It's a transform component. And I'm going to call this bullet spawn. So I need to know that. That is the location of where I want the bullet to come out of or where I want it to appear anyway. Okay. Let's go back into the editor right now and you're going to see in the player when it recompiles there's a little space that comes up that says bullet spawn. I'm just going to drag and drop from the bullet spawn in the in the player hierarchy. I'm going to take the bullet spawn and drag and drop it into here like so. Now I have a reference of where the bullet spawn is inside of my player component. It's that simple. To quote Tim Cook. All right? And once we have the bullet spawn, now I can do lots of stuff with it. I can instantiate any prefabs that go in there. So I need a bullet. Let's make a new public game object. We'll call this bullet, right? This would be the sphere that I talked about in the assignment four description, bullet. So in the bullet, what I want to do is I need to make a drag and drop an object that appears to be as a sphere. Let's make a bullet. So again, remember the numbers 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 is the sphere size that I want. Let's make a new sphere. So 3D object. This is outside of player, somewhere over here, right? So 3D object, sphere. It's going to make it pretty big, right? It's way over there. My sphere isn't can't be so big. It's going to be size of 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. We're going to move it closer so we can see it okay, in 3D space. That's my sphere. Let's make it a different color, right? So maybe we want my sphere to be a color that we can see, like red, right? Or like yellow, something that makes it look different and we can discern from the regular gun, all right? So I'm going to go back into my materials. I'm going to uh, go to gun metal and I'm going to control D and make another duplicate of it. We're going to call this bullet. And all I'm going to do here is I'm going to keep the specular because I want it shiny, but I want to change the albedo right to a yellowish color. Okay, something like up here, like a golden sphere. I don't know. It's up to you what you want to do. I'm just making it golden. Maybe, maybe even make it more orangey, like a burnt orange kind of color, maybe in there, right? Um, and you can make the you can change the values so whatever you want to be a little bit uh, closer to that color, it doesn't matter. Then what I want to do is I want to go to my sphere and I'm going to drag and drop my bullet to where the materials are. So bullet materials, and now you can see my my sphere is going to be this really weird metallic orangey color. All right, my sphere is also going to have a script 
that is going to drive the bullet. And I'm going to use my own custom two things we need. We need some kind of collider that we need to program. Um, and we also need some kind of way that the thing moves. Okay, that's what we need. So a couple things we can do. Let's add in a, uh, a script. So going back to scripts, I'm going to right click. I'm going to right click on the script and I'm going to create a new C sharp script that I'm going to call bullet behavior. This is for all bullets, right? They're going to have their own script. So I'm going to go to my sphere. Let's rename the sphere bullet. And let's, on the sphere itself, let's drag and drop the bullet behavior on the add component area. Let's remove the sphere collider because remember, I don't want to use anything that's given to me by Unity. I want to make my own collision detection system. So I'm going to go here and remove my component. So no more collider for the sphere. And that's okay. All right, cool. Now that I have a script and I have a bullet, let's make this into a prefab. I'm going to make a new folder in my assets. Right click, create, folder, prefabs. And in my prefabs folder, I'm going to double click, drag and drop the bullet from here into my prefabs folder. So it's the reverse. I'm going from my hierarchy into my prefabs folder, like so. What this does is it creates a reusable object similar to something like a blueprint in Unreal, where I can call upon this object again, and it'll instantiate um, uh, this object over and over again, almost like a little class, if you will. Okay, now that I have a bullet, my player can be fed that information. Notice my player is looking for a bullet. Well, I can just simply drag and drop from my prefabs folder, bullet, into my bullet area of my player, like so. And now I can get rid of this. So my there's no sphere in here by, by default. My player is going to connect to the prefab that I have here in my, my prefabs folder it's going to use it to generate a new prefab when I want to. And I need to put it where it's going to start at bullet spawn. That's where it's going to appear for the first time. All right. Let's go back to my player behavior. Actually, let's check this. Are you with me? Because I did a lot there. Right? So I did a bunch of stuff and I'm trying to go slow guys but we're also I'm also trying to respect time it's 1218 I want to make sure that you guys have a good sense of how to put something like this together um, I know it's interesting for most of you if you haven't done this before if you've never used unity then it's a new experience um, you know it's okay remember that I'm recording this session so you can always go back later on and, and view the video if you need to to recreate what I've done with you um, slowly slowly by stopping me and going forward and there's similar examples and tutorials online where you can go online and do the same thing. All right, this is great. Thank you for that feedback. I'm going to continue. So now I'm going to double click on my player behavior and it's going to bring me back to the script. So I have access to a bullet. I have access to the bullet location called bullet spawn. So what I want to do is when I click the left mouse button, I want to generate a bullet for now. And I just want to put it in the same spot. So that's fine. I want to do this once. There's a couple ways to do this. I want to get an input. So remember we did this last time, but I want to talk about input. So input, there's an input system. Let's go back to the Unity editor for a second to explain. If I go to file or edit, I mean, and if I go to project settings, under project settings, there is something called input manager. Again, I went to edit, project settings, okay? Input manager, this is where we're gonna configure our input. Notice that there is something called axes. I have a size of 18, there's 18 different inputs that I can use, right? I have something called horizontal and vertical input. I also have fire one, right? Fire one, it says that fire one is left control on the keyboard and mouse zero, okay, for now. It looks like the type is key or mouse button, right? And the axis is the x-axis. 
Okay, that's what this, this little input field is. It's an input property, if you will. So what, how I'm going to do it is I'm going to say, hey, input, get fire access. Get access, fire. Right? That's what I want. Okay. So going back to my script, I'm going to say that if my input dot get access and I want to use fire, but remember what it is. It's not just fire. If I go f edit project settings, fire one is what it's called. That's the name fire one. If that is being clicked and I can use a threshold. So if it's greater than 0.1 F, let's say we use that as a threshold, right? We don't have to use that, but if it's greater than if I've clicked onto it, right? So if I'm triggering the fire button, right, then, and by the way, there's other ways to do this as well, which we're going to talk about. Then I want to, let's do a debug.log to make sure that it works. I'll do a debug.log fire, right? So it's going to print out in our console, debug.log. So input is the input system. Get access. If you use horizontal, that would be A and D keys. If I use vertical, that would be the W and S keys or the up and down arrows. So there's some defaults, right? Greater than 0.1 means out of the dead zone for the actual button itself, just slightly out of the dead zone, 0.1, okay? But it's like a key press as well. We're gonna talk about this. There's other things we can do for the fire button. All right, so let's see if this works, right? So if I run it, and what I'm looking for is when I press the button, now you can see that it indeed fires. And you can see that it's down in here, but I, and I also have a little console window that comes up up here. So you can see that every time I press the button, I'm getting like a bunch of thousands of events that come up. Okay. Cool, so it's working, but it's working like a lot, like too much. Okay, well let's take a look at the Unity documentation for this. So there is a couple of things we can do here. So if I go to input dot get access and there's input dot get access raw. There's two. Input dot get access and input dot get access raw. Input dot get access raw, this is the Unity documentation by the way. You can always look it up like this. So I told you Unity is amazingly documented, right? It says returns the value of the virtual access identified by access name with no smoothing filtered apl filtering applied. Right? So that means now this is where what you want to do is if you're constantly pressing something that you want to multiply it by something like delta time and this way it'll slow it down. Okay? So input dot get access raw, let's say fire times delta time, time dot delta time. Alright? So it's gonna be scaled by the delta time and in terms of how often I, I fire, right? Um, I'm also going to suggest that you look up other ways of doing it. If I say get access by itself, that's scaled. So uh, it's scaled between, norm normally it's scaled between 0 and 1, right? So notice it says the value will be either arranged in negative 1 to 1 for keyboard and joystick input. Since input is not smooth, keyboard input will always be either negative 1, 0, or 1. Those are the three things. So that's perfect for a button, either on or off. So I want to say that it's equal to 1 now. So if I go back to player behavior, it's not scaled, so this will not work. Well, actually this will work. Anything greater than 0 would work as well. If I change this to raw, right, input dot get access raw is greater than 0, I could just say, instead of 0, uh, 0, .0 zero anything greater than 0, that means if I press any button, or if I keep pressing the button, right, as an example, it'll continue to fire. So again, if I, if I went to do this again and if I press play it's going to clear this up and if I press it once you can see that I get a bunch of I got 62 times it triggered all right that's a lot right and I want to slow this down a little bit I want to slow this down a little bit so what you can do is you can use a kind of timer for this as well and what you can do is you can say something like if right and what you want to do is use the timer dot, and you want to use the frame count or something like that. There's ways of counting down as well, but let's use frame count for now. 
I can see if if time dot frame count percentage, let's say every 30 frames, right? If that is equal to zero, that means if I divide my frame count by 30, this is modulus, right? Every 30 frames, then I can fire. So I won't trigger all the time, only every other, every half second is what I want to trigger. This is going to slow down my firing rate. Otherwise, my fire rate is going to be way too much. Okay? So then if I go back, right, and if I clear this, and if I run it, and now if I trigger it, then I'm going to get a much slower firing rate. Much slower. And this is what I want. Okay? So this mechanism, it what it does is it delays firing. Right? That's what it does. Okay? And you know what? I single responsibility principle tells me that I want to put this in my in my update. Let's make a method for this. So we're going to say make a method. We're going to go to private void and we'll call this fire. Okay? Again, it's up to you well, how you want to do this. I want to take this whole thing, cut it out, put it inside there, and then in my update function call fire. Okay? Keep the update clean is the idea. All right, cool. So we've done this. Also, this is hard coded. I don't like hard coding values like this. Let's make it so this is the fire rate. We might choose that this is too high still. Maybe you want to do it every 60 frames, once a second maximum, right? So we can say this is the fire rate. And we say there is no fire rate, but we can make it a public integer called fire rate here. Fire rate fire rate, right? And then inside of my, my player behavior, if I go to my player behavior object, I can see the fire rate. Let's set it to 30. That's the fire rate. You can also normalize this 0 to 1 and then divide it and do that funny stuff if you really want to. It's up to you. But that now provides a fire rate for me. So it's not going to fire all the time. Let's get rid of the debug.log. And let's put in the instantiate statement that I talked about before. Okay, so this is how it goes. I want to use Unity's mono behavior to instantiate a new object. The way it works is I use the word instantiate. I call the prefab that I want. That's the object. Let's call this the bullet. Where do I want to instantiate it? The transform, which is going to be the bullet spawn. And I also should put in quaternion identity. All right, which means I'm not looking for it to rotate. Okay, those are the three things that I want. So bullet, bullet spawn, quaternion identity. All right. Now there's an error, and what it says is create the method instantiate. Well, that's interesting. Why would it do that? So let's see if that if that works. And if I hover over, it says cannot resolve method instantiate of type game object, unity transform, and quaternion. What, I, what it means is maybe it needs a position instead of a transform. Because it doesn't have that method. It doesn't have a, an overload for that method. All right, so whenever I click the button, a new uh, bullet is going to spawn. And you're going to see the effect. So I'm going to go back to here. And if we did it right, if I press it, and if I move it around, and if I do this, you're going to see that I can draw nicely with bullets. Woohoo! Right? I can keep drawing bullets all over the place. In fact, I can make a little drawing program where I walk around and draw it in 3D. Yay! I'll make the bullets over here, and let's put some bullets over here. They're going to hover in 3D space here, right? Where I want to put the bullets over here and here. Yeah? Yeah? How about that? And then kind of do it over here in this area. It's not a drawing program, though, is it? We're not supposed to do drawing. Here's another question. Is it drawing where it's supposed to? Right? So uh, it's drawing near my uh, gun. Right? There it is. Kind of drawing where it's supposed to, kind of. Right? There it is. All right? Hey, take a look at that frame counter. Right? My frame counter dropped a lot. Right? Why? Well, I'm putting all these extra objects. Look at all these clones on the screen. I got like 
a bunch of bullets just sitting there. Woohoo! Isn't that neat? Right? Woo! That makes that's making me dizzy. But it's like drawing in 3D or using something like um, some 3D rendering for the drawing program, right? All right, and let's move this back over here. And uh, right, and how about over here? Right. So it's kind of off for a little bit. Well, this is okay. No, my CPU can take it, man. All right, so that's pretty cool. So that's what it does. That's what Instantiate does. So Instantiate creates the bullet. Okay. And but but the problem with Instantiation is performance-wise, I've made a bunch of bullets, and as soon as I uh, I make a bullet like this, it's gonna just hang there. It's not gonna do anything, right? Let's add to our bullet behavior. All right, so going back to our bullet behavior now, I want it to move, right? I want it to move. So I want to say that on update, so this is the bullet now. So when the bullet comes out, I want it to take its transform, and I want to add a couple things. Velocity, so some kind of speed. Let's make this public. So bullets are going to have some kind of speed right whatever it's gonna be I need a direction and the direction is gonna be my forward okay it's gonna be my forward but what forward is what we're talking about what's the direction <clears throat> so I need a direction so we're gonna say public and it's gonna be a vector 3 and and I want to talk about this a little bit, right? Because we want to kind of think about what is forward. So the direction that's forward is going to be the forward of my gun, wherever my gun is pointing to, right? So we're going to say direction. Uh, it's a public vector 3, but it's not really going to do much for me right now. I don't really have to do this public vector 3 stuff. What I really want to say is, I want to, when I instantiate this thing, I want to, first of all, let's make my bullet behavior. Let's do a couple things. Let's say that uh, uh, for the first part, I want to change my bullet behavior so that it's serialized. So I'll say serialize system dot serializable. Please do that so I can access my bullet behavior anytime, as soon as there's a bullet in play. So what I want is on update, I want to add every frame right some kind of vector 3 object in the direction that I'm going okay so I'm going to say that my transform dot position for the bullet right I want to add or add on something I want to add my direction to the my direction vector to the bullet, right? Multiply by times uh, by speed, sorry. Multiply by time dot delta time. Okay, so that's what it is. So this is like the time value. So think about physics, what I'm doing here. I'm saying I got a direction. This is my vector. Combined with speed, right? This is going to give me a, a velocity right multiply by time VT right which is what I'm doing here okay and I'm adding it on to position so P naught T plus VT is what I'm doing here every frame okay so this is pretty cool so I've got that and it's gonna add on to it but it might be too fast or too slow that's why I want the speed to be available us up up here and I want to set the direction let's make the direction right now um, uh, I'll set the direction by default to uh, direction is going to be equal to just for now just to test it when I make a bullet in, in the screen uh, a vector 3 dot forward okay that's what I'm going to make it right now 
vector 3 dot forward if you look at it is 0, 0, 1 into the screen okay that's incorrect but let's just use that as a as an example and speed let's make a speed of 4 and let's see what happens with that those numbers okay what I'm gonna do to test this instead of playing the game and clicking the button I'm gonna bring a bullet prefab in play so I'm gonna say hey bullet prefab come in play my speed is gonna be 4 right and my direction vector is gonna be 1 by default all right and then if I press play let's let's watch this happen in real time it's gonna go like shooting in this direction right let's see if it happens so there it is and it's gonna go forever and ever and ever way down there all right and if I press it it's just gonna keep going in the same direction now for and ever and ever and ever and ever right Woo. Uh, na, 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 na. different kind of drawing right and it's coming right out of my my thing but it's not really going in the direction that I want it to right it's going way over there I want it to go where my reticle is right and for that what I need to do I need to program this direction so I don't have to show this direction here I can make this actually uh, public if I want to or private but what I want to do with the direction let's just zero it out and the, the speed is okay speed looks fine is I want to pass in the direction when I instantiate the bullet so that what I'm gonna say is I'm gonna go back to my uh, player behavior and I'm gonna say that whatever the forward is from my player behavior that is gonna be the direction let's try that first that is gonna be the direction that I want to put for my bullet but here I just instantiate the bullet I can use an auto variable equivalent in C sharp called var where I can say var bullet is equal to and we'll say bullet temp bullet temp bullet right is equal to this this is actually a game object and because I know it's a bullet I can say something like this I can say that temp bullet dot get component right bullet behavior and then I want to set the direction to vector my forward right which is transform dot forward okay transform dot forward is actually the transform that I'm looking at right now where I'm looking so that is going to change the direction of the bullet to transform dot forward now what this is going to do is as soon as I change it this is happening when I fire it this is not happening every frame so I fire it once it takes my transform forward and it's gone I fire and forget so what this means is let's get rid of this bullet now from the scene so we don't need this one anymore if I press play and if I press fire you can see that no matter where I'm looking now it's gonna go in approximately the direction that I'm going not quite where I'm looking it's where my player is looking not where my cannon is looking see where my player is looking I'm looking there that's forward but my cannon is looking down here all right cool cool we're getting there so we don't want this forward right oops we don't want this the players forward we want access to the cannon the cannons forward right wherever the cannon is looking all right wherever the cannon is pointing to okay so it's tricky right I need to get a reference to the cannon itself the cannon object and I do that in the player component so let's go back to the code and I want that I'll say and here's the trick for it so bullet spawn is here let's go back one step I'll say public and I want the transform for this thing transform and I want to call it the cannon the cannons transform all right here it is and I'll try this out we may not work at first we may have to make some adjustments or offsets but here's the cannons transform but I can't get to it right well the cannon is actually right here if I just drag and drop it's actually dragging and dropping onto itself let's do this I'm gonna go with the cannon 
and drag and drop. There's other ways to do this, by the way, by programmatically doing this. But here I'm dragging and dropping the transform of the cannon here. All right, cool. That's different now. Now that I have the cannon, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, instead of using transform forward, I want the cannon forward. Because the cannon is the transform, right? I just call the cannon. So I'm getting a reference of the cannon's transform here, and I'm passing it into the bullet's direction. Okay, let's see if that works. Maybe. Maybe not. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, see, that's wrong. Why? Because my cannon, it's not bad actually, it's because my cannon is rotated 90 degrees. Right? Right? My cannon is rotated 90 degrees. So I want to take my cannon and rotate it. My forward is not my forward. My forward is like rotated down, right? It's down It's down here. That's where my cannon is. So I want to rotate this by uh, a Euler rotation, right? By 90 degrees, Nine, negative 90. Let's try that. So I want to say that, or by 90, let's say, right? So I want to take my cannon forward multiplied by a I want an Euler rotation, right? So if I want to say uh, a vector three dot rotate towards. Now notice it says, here's my current. That's one thing I could do, rotate towards. How about if I wanted to just rotate my object? So I want to, I want to kind of say that my forward. Can I? It's a forward is a is a. Of a value, right? Let's make it so it's another thing. So I'll say that var, we'll call it like um, we have direction already, right? So we can say that direction. So we don't have direction here. We have direction there. So we have to say var direction, which is just a, a thing, right? Is equal to. Well, this is the last thing we'll do, guys, and I'll let you guys go. Uh, is equal to the. Um, Canon dot forward, so that's the direction, right? And now that I have that, I want to rotate this. I want to have a vector, right? I want to rotate the vector. Can I rotate the vector? Well, I know that the canon itself is a transform. So I could say rotate, right? I could rotate and I could use a vector three Euler, right? So that's what I want. I want an Euler rotation, right? As, a, as opposed to a quaternion. I can use a quaternion rotation. What I really want is a vector three Euler, right? That's something like that, like an Euler rotation. So let me see if I can look that up because I forgot. Uh, vector three Euler rotation. Right, is what I want. Oh, transform that Euler angles. A quaternion Euler. There it is. Quaternion Euler. Uh, quaternion dot Euler. Right, and then I can put in a vector three object. So a new vector three object, where I want to pass in uh, x, y, and z coordinates. So on the x axis, because that's where it's rotated inside of Unity. Right. Notice Unity is rotated by 90. Let's rotate this by 90 and see what happens. So 90 degrees, right? 0 0.0, 0, 0, 0, right? So that's what I want is the quaternion Euler, right? Now it says that returns a rotation in degrees, right? And what did I do wrong? Cannot return void. So maybe what I want to do is I want to say something like, sorry, I want to say that uh, direction is equal to canon. Couple steps, and and I can say direction dot rotate. And why is this giving me an issue? Go to the documentation one sec. Sorry, I want to make sure it's right, guys. 
rotation, it's quaternion oil. Okay. Oh, you just put the numbers in there. I did too much. That's all. Rotate Quaternion Euler. Zero, 030, zero, and that's the rotation, but that has to be a Quaternion. And is that what it's looking for? Euler, so vector three. Current orientation. Um, yeah, I could. That's another way I could do it. I could I could get the because it's a transform. I get the whole transform of the cannon, right? So I could do that as well. I could say that the um, the direction, which could be a transform, right, is my cannon, right? And I could say that the uh, once I have the direction is it, which is the transform, right? What I want to do is I want to rotate it back. I want to rotate it by some kind of Euler, which is a new vector three object. Let's see if I can do that. New vector three. I think that might work if I can actually type vector and then put 90 in there. So I can probably do this in one step. So I can say instead of uh, canon, so that is my direction. And then I can put direction dot forward. I mean, it's kind of in a couple steps, but whatever. Let's see if that works. Because really what I want is I want to rotate by 90 degrees. It might be negative 90, that's the value. Let's see. All right. Um, and let's go to that and we'll run it. And let's see what happens. Okay, that's weird, but whatever. It kind of does. Oh, it goes from 90 to negative 90. Look at that. It goes for the whole gamut. Why? Direction is equal to direction dot forward. Oh, yeah. That is so funny, right? Because what's happening is, I know what's happening. Um, let's try that again. Let's, let's get rid of this crap. Um, let's just say transform dot four so canon dot forward and then I want to if I if I was to uh, rotate this thing right so I want to rotate this uh, forward this is the transform um, by 90 degrees before I fire it which is kind of what I want to try over there but didn't quite work um, and maybe I can get the cannons orientation uh, multiplied by some kind of uh, the orientation of the of the cannon itself. Yeah, that's a problem. Because right now, what's happening is my orientation, my um, of the cannon. It's well, actually, I've just scaled it. I really haven't rotated it, so that's why it's it's having a bit of a problem. So what I have to do is, if I want it to point to where it's going, I'm actually doing too much work. So, sorry, see, I'm just being dumb. Um, so it's pointing forward, right? But what I wanted to do is actually angle it this way around the, uh, and then the forward will work just fine. Instead of pointing forward, it's gotta to point towards my, uh, where it's supposed to go. So I'm gonna rotate it on the, uh, across the Y axis, all right, as well. So right now it goes, it goes down, but I also want it to go uh, kind of this way and we have to look and see what that looks like in the game right like minus 11 degrees or whatever because that is what we want right so cannon forward you know as an example is fine it's going to go down but but we also want it to go to the left a little bit because it's just going to do what it's going to do and I can I can try that by rotating it towards my object and in game we can see what it looks like so we can see that it looks this way and what I want to do is I also want to point it up towards my reticle right so up is on the x-axis right so kind of towards the reticle I'm just using this as a, as a guide let's say something like 80 degrees 
right? And minus 16, it looks like more accurate of where it's supposed to go. Maybe a little bit more, maybe minus 20, maybe even more. Nope, too much. Minus 25, let's say. I'm pointing up in the sky so I don't get distracted. So it looks like it's going towards there. Okay, so that's the value, 80 and minus 25. Let's go back, 80 and minus 25. Now it's still gonna be wrong. It's gonna go down because of my rotation, right? Because the whole thing has been rotated to, to that level, right? So if I run it now, right? It's gonna go way out to no man's land, right? Let's save this and do it again. I didn't save it. So, right? But it's kind of towards the same direction. It's just pointing downwards. So I, I just want to take that that cannons forward, whatever that is, and then I want to rotate. Uh, so that's the the direction, and I want to rotate it back. I want to have that direction because this direction is a a vector three, right? But I want to rotate the cannon itself, the transform, up by 80 degrees. That's the only thing that has to happen. So let's try that. So I'll say cannon dot rotate. Or maybe it's set rotation, if I'm not wrong. Nope. Yeah. It might be even local rotation, but anyways. Local rotation is a transform. Sorry, I just want to make sure I do this right, because I don't want to mess you guys up. Space relative to Eulers. Let's try that. So we'll say, uh, rotate. Uh, is a new vector 3 object which is 80 degrees and I don't want it to add to it I just want to do it once so rotate it according to where I am and then fire it let's see if that works or if I'm crazy I might be crazy whoa that's interesting it's not what I wanted I'm rotating the cannon but it's going in the right direction at some point. <laughs> almost, we're almost there. It's awesome. It's rotating it every single time. So I want to say dot rotation. So canon dot local rotation dot local rotation, right? And I think if ro local rotation, it gives me a, is a, um, a getter and setter vector three. I want to try. I want to do it so it does it once. That's all I want because right now it's always rotating, right? And why isn't this working? I need to have a quaternion Euler, I think, because it's, it's it's requiring a quaternion. Quaternion. This is what I did before. Oh, here it is. Quaternion Euler. Uh, Eighty. I just want to do it once. That's all I want. Yay! Okay, that worked. And let's see if I can do this again. Sorry, it's just Unity. It's going to still rotate, but it's going to go... in the wrong direction. Let's go minus 80. So, Canon local rotation is this. Let's go minus 80. I want, I'm just curious of what this is doing, because I'm rotating the Canon one time yep it does it once but it rotates the cannon not the the objects isn't that neat kind of fires it off into oblivion cool all right so if i went to 80 just on that axis alone because that's the only axis that needs to be adjusted If I click it, it should adjust it more. Good. And what I want to do is I don't want to do the direct cannon itself. I want to make a new variable. So var uh, direction is equal to cannon. And I want to say direction is equal to local rotation and then direction forward. Let's see if that works. You see what I'm trying to do, right? I'm trying to basically rotate the bullet where it's supposed to go. Nope. 
it's get. I mean, it's 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 doing what I'm telling it to do. Really, it's kind of in the right direction. It's just going in the wrong place. So, uh, what else can we do? That's another object. We can also rotate the bullet spawn. Hmm. So what if we did that? So the bullet spawn has a rotation of negative 90, right? So let's say, let's make the bullet spawn negative 80 instead. What if we did that? So instead of the cannon, we made the bullet spawn the thing we want. So let's say negative 80, because the bullet spawn is just an empty game object. And instead of doing the cannon here, we'll call this the, we already have the bullet spawn. Uh, rotation so we can probably get dispensed with the cannon let's just try this out so we'll just uh, not do this at all and then just go bullet spawn forward because that is it, was, it, it it doesn't matter about the cannon right so let's see if that works hey it needs to be a little bit higher but it's almost in the same direction Right. So now it needs to be adjusted by the cannon forward, which is minus 25 on the y-axis. So let's say 25. If I change the bullet spawn to 25, let's see how that looks. Getting better. Right. It's not quite where the reticle is, but that's okay. At least it's going towards the direction I want. We can get rid of the reticle too. Right? That's pretty good. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to get rid of the reticle because we don't need it. Because it's messing us up. And um, which is totally fine. So reticle, goodbye. Delete. Okay, now we can get clean up our code and I'll send this to you. So we didn't need the cannon at all. Goodbye, cannon. We just needed the bullet spawn, which makes sense because it's not rotated and we have more control over it. We don't need the start method here at all uh, of this thing for now. And this is good enough, right? So this sends your bullet in the direction you want. The bullet, I still think the fire rate is too great. We may want to cut this down even more and we can do that inside the editor now. So I can go to player, I can go fire rate. Let's make it like 50 or 40. Let's try 40 first and see what that looks like. Still seems to be a little bit, needs to go a little bit higher than that. Let's go back to the, I'm just going to adjust it manually. Bullet spawn, we're going to go up by, uh, let's say, to 35. Let's see what that looks like. Again, I'm rotating kind of up this way, right? Much better. A little bit more, even more. Right, what do you think? It's almost there. It's not quite not quite right. Maybe we'll make it negative ninety. Let's see what that looks like. Sorry, I just want to make sure it, it just has the right effect. You know what? That might be better. That looks like it's coming right out of the bolt the, the cannon now. But they're going forever. Okay. And let's make a frame count that's way different. So player, I'm going to go to my frame rate as 100. So it's not exactly every frame. It's every other frame. Right? And it's firing in the direction we want. Okay, your job. I've done a lot of it already for you. Um, right now I'm instantiating. And that's okay. Instantiation is a good thing, but the challenge with instantiation is it only does it once, right? Um, and what you want to do is you want to uh, create a pool of objects, right, that I call upon every frame, right? So that's something that I'm doing instead of instantiating. Um, the other thing is that I'm every time I fire a bullet, it's going to keep going till for oblivion, right? So we can do some tricks to make it go away. For example, it can only have a firing distance. 
So if it goes like way off into the distance, something like a, the diff, the distance between, and I know this is expensive, but who cares? I could say that when the bullet fires, we could give it a distance, maximum distance from the player's cannon, right? We just could say that, just so that way we can not have things hanging out in space, right? So let's do that. So, and then I'll stop for the day, I swear. So in my bullet on update, I want to check to see, this is the movement. So we'll say that here, you can get a lifetime, sure. That's another way of doing it. Um, that might be better. A lifetime would be you have to count somehow, right? Um, but let's suppose, or you can use a coroutine if you want to try that as well. I'm not going to go there right now, make it simple. Let's make a new private void. Sorry guys, I know I'm timing out here. Move, move method here in the bullet so we can clean it up. The move method will be here. You can obviously change this. If you want to make it more like a grenade type bullet, then this, this would be wrong, right? You'd want to make it so that you want to use gravity. Right now, there's no gravity that's pulling the bullet down, okay? Um, so you'd have to have some kind of acceleration due to gravity in the down direction, right? And that's not, not a big deal. And in the update, what I want to do is call move. And I want to use that famous check bounds thing. We don't have it here, but we'll add it in, check bounds. So we'll say that private void check bounds. We'll say that if the distance between if vector three dot distance uh, or, I mean, you know, you can you can call it from the origin, right, or whatever. Um, again, from the origin to wherever it's going, right? So if the transform dot position and the origin, which is vector 3 dot 0, right, because the origin is kind of the thing. If the distance uh, is greater than, let's say, 100, then what we want to do is we want to destroy the object that this bullet is thing. So this is the, uh, uh, this thing's uh, object. Destroy the game object that belongs to this bullet. This game object is lowercase. And so what this does is it'll remove the bullet after a while. Let's test this and see if it's true, if it works. So check bounds, if it's greater than 100, then it'll go away. Let's see if that's true. So, and we should see them after a while and the stuff there, we'll see what it is. We'll see if they go away. If they, they still hang out there, that's not cool, right? Because it looks like they are going, going, going. So 50, we're still quite a distance from 100. Maybe 100 is too much. But I want to see, start seeing it go away. There it goes. So it starts cleaning itself up. So maybe 100 is too much. Let's make it so that it's 50 or even 20. That's the distance this thing can be fired. And what we want to do is we don't want to hard code this. We want some kind of uh, distance or range, we'll call it, right? So we'll say public uh, float range is we want to put this in. So this is the range. So if it's greater than the range, then it destroys the game object. And we can kind of just go, and this is a range from the origin. Uh, it's not a range from the, from the, from the bullet. <clears throat> so it's not really that accurate, but it's okay for us, right? So um, if I go to player, or if I go to bullet, I mean, so there's my bullet in my prefabs. And then if I change the rate, the speed is whatever it's gonna be. Again, you want it, for the bullet, you want to assume that there's going to be a speed that you're going to use. I'm going to use a speed of like four. And my range is going to be something like 20. So that's the standard, uh, what it's going to be. So four and 20. Four and 20. And if I run it now, we should see it kind of add up there. But then after it goes to 20, it's going to start cleaning itself up. Right? There it goes again. So it deletes them all. Right? It's not really a bullet pool, but it doesn't make them last forever either, right? Um, one last thing is you want to make it so that they don't pollute your 
um, your hierarchy like that, it's too annoying for all the bullets to come into the hierarchy. So let's make it so that we make a bullets uh, empty object, right? Um, and Or call it a bullet manager. Let's call it the bullet manager. And this is where, like I told you before, you want to program your, um, uh, your bullet pool in the bullet manager itself. So I would go do that. I would right click and go new 3D object, uh, new, new empty called bullet manager. And inside the bullet manager script, let's do that. So I want to make a new C sharp script called bullet manager. And I'm going to attach the C sharp script to this empty object just by dragging and dropping. There it is. Okay, bullet manager has got a script, whatever. The script doesn't do anything right now. It's done, nothing, who cares? But because I dragged and dropped it on there, I can make it so that the bullet behavior, it searches for the bullet manager when it's instantiated. So when I instantiate a bullet with my player, right, I can say that the temp bullet, I want to find objects uh, with tag so let's say I make a new thing called, and I'll make it private, and I'll call it bullet manager. Call it bullet manager. And what you can do is I want to find objects of type. So in my uh, start method, I got rid of it. In my start method, I can say something like bullet manager. is equal to find objects of type, object of type, bullet manager. So what this does is it find object of type, searches the hierarchy. So in Unity, it searches this to find anything that has a bullet manager script on it, like this one. So it finds it. And now what I can do is I can say that each bullet, its transform parent is equal to the bullet manager. So I can say that temp bullet dot set uh, dot transform dot set parent to the bullet manager dot game object dot transform dot parent dot parent probably can do it simpler than that but it's okay Bullet manager is the script. Game object, it's its game object. Transform is the bullet manager's game object's transform. And parent, uh, sorry, I don't want parent. It's got to be this transform. So temp bullet transform set parent, the parent of the transform is now the bullet manager. Okay, so why did I do this? Then what I can do is I can start attaching the bullet manager over there and it says okay object reference not sent to instance of an object it's trying to find something it's trying to find the uh, bullet manager and it can't find it and why is that that I can't find the bullet manager script bullet manager dot game object transform set parent uh, well, okay, the other object, the other way to do it is just to pull it in. I hate to do that, but whatever. Uh, pull it. Actually, we can even make it, instead of a bullet manager type, we can make it something else, but it's okay. Bullet manager is there. And then I can just go into um, the player. And I have bullet manager as drag and drop. I mean, that's a simpler way. I'm not happy with that, but whatever. And yeah, now look, take a look. So what this does is inside the bullet managers where all the all the bullets live, so it doesn't pollute your hierarchy. All right? Let's try, show you that again. So ba boom, and you can see that that's all there, right? And then, but the bullets are all inside of the bullet manager itself. Nice. 
it's not an object pool. This is just a way of a, it's a container right now, right? That we've got access to. But this is where the bullet manager is where you're gonna script your object pool. So instead of me doing an instantiate, what I wanna do is I wanna get a bullet from the bullet manager, right? And when the, uh, when the bullet itself, and this is the bullet, when the bullet uh, leaves bounds, instead of destroying the bullet, we want to return a bullet back to the pool. Okay, just like we've done before. And yes, you can make a bullet manager into a singleton if you want. Um, that's fine too. You can also make a bullet factory. I've done all those kind of examples in other courses. In fact, if you want to see where those courses are, um, there's one that I've done at, at uh, George Brown, which is totally legal for us to use because it's here. So I can tell it, you tell you about it. Um, if you look at game 2014, so if you look up at um, our GitHub folder, and if you look at uh, George Brown, and if you look inside of the uh, game 2014 folder, there is an example in here of a bullet manager. So if you just go into game 2014 and you look in here, um, if you look at assets and if you look at uh, scripts, there's an example of a bullet manager right here. And it gives you the script, an example of how I, I would do You'd have to adapt this example, but there's an example here of how you can create a queue, just like we did in C++ and SDL, to hold the bullet, uh, to create a bullet pool. Um, and we use a vector in, in C++, but you can use a queue. And it has all the object references here. So you can do things like, I can build a bullet pool, I can get a bullet and I can also uh, return a bullet back to the pool. Okay, so there's all examples of how to do that right here. Okay, you'd have to adapt it though for your use. All right, that's plenty. So I've got save this, we've gone way over, file save, file save project. And now you have a firing gun. You still don't have collisions, but you have a firing gun where I can fire it from any angle in my space is a little bit slow to be honest i don't like how the speed of the the bullets because i can probably catch them if i want to look right so you might want to make the bullets faster so instead of the bullet being like four or whatever it is maybe in the prefabs you want to make the bullets like firing speed is 10 something like that let's try that instead just so that way it's like more realistic i can't catch the bullet maybe i still can that's 10. All right, let's try 20. Okay, again, it's like, no, it's still slow. So what it's doing, see how the bullet speed is? Speed is four. So it's being set somewhere. Let's where, where is it being set? I said, I think I set it, hard coded it. So I hear it is speed four, yeah. So we don't want this. We want the speed of the bullet being set by the uh, by the editor, that's much better, as opposed to being hard coded in here. Yeah, that's better. More, more, more makes more sense. Now it's too fast. Let's go back to ten. I was thinking, I was like, wow, that's really fast for a bullet. And that's weird too, the way it fires and moves. It's firing in the direction that it was firing the bullet. It's great stationary bullets, but not great when I'm moving. Why? Because it's adjusting its its uh, its firing rate to where I'm looking. Again, there's some there's definitely some issues, but it's a fire and forget mechanism, right? I mean, at least I can spray the you know kind of the thing the way I have it. And it's fairly accurate. I can still aim. I can see where I'm aiming and kind of aim down and aim down. I'm not aiming down sights, but you know, I can make it work. I still think it's probably okay where we had it. Let's go back to four, but you know, let's see how that works. Yeah, it's more reasonable. We won't be, we can chase it. We can chase the bullet, <laughs> but at least it's like, it's going to aim where it's going to go. I think it's good enough guys. Because really, it's just an example of some speed. So this is an example. Uh, you can definitely extend this example, make it better, um, add things like um, 
I'll push it for sure. So save, save project. I'll close this off, and then I'll push it up for you guys. All right, uh, get push. So, oh, how about get add dot, get add dot, get commit minus M, and I'll say added uh, bullet firing. There you go. All right, I'm gonna stop this now. We've gone over time a lot, and uh, for those people who are watching, this is the last uh, lecture for physics. I know we didn't really do physics today, we did Unity, but I'm trying to help with your assignment number four, okay? So let's uh, stop recording this and I'll see you guys uh, next week uh, during your exam period. All right, so do you have any questions for me?